Good morning, everyone. Let's try that one more time. Are you excited to be here? Good morning, everyone. That was a little bit better. Just want to give a warm welcome to each and every one of you here today. As you can see, today is a very special day here at Camelback. What is today? Our Women's Ministry Day. Somebody said BBS. Yes, that's true. There is BBS across the way. But today in the sanctuary, we are celebrating Women's Ministries Day. And this celebration is not only for women. This is for women and men alike. Um, as you can see on the screen, our theme is Tune Our Hearts. And so right now we're going to tune our hearts and sing a song that I think most of us know called Heavenly Sunshine. And we are going to sing it with gusto. Sunshine, heavenly sunshine, flooded my soul with glory divine. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, hallelujah, Jesus is mine. Let's sing it one more time. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, flooded my soul with glory divine. Heavenly sunshine. put a smile on most of our faces, heavenly sunshine. We are so excited about today's program, um, but before we initiate, there are a few housekeeping things that um, we want to go over. We have a second reading, um, a transfer, a membership transfer out for John Minnick. And he is transferring to the Mesa Palms uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church in Mesa, Arizona. Do I? Okay. <laughs> Do I have a second? Yep. Very good. All in favor, say aye. Aye. And those opposed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so there's one opposed, but I think the motion is carried. So thank you all for that. Um, also, if you have a bulletin, I'd like for you to open it up. There are a few things that we want to share with you. One of them is um, this conference-wide family ministries retreat coming up next month. I want to encourage all of our families to try to register for this event. It's a um, $15 only event and we need to register soon so if you're planning on going to it look over the look over the information and register as soon as you can to reserve your spot um, the most pressing thing that I would like to share with you guys this morning is that there is another work bee tomorrow at eight o'clock. All of the information is here in your bulletin. Last week we had a work bee and I am grateful for the handful that came out. And God blessed, but we really could have needed, we, we could have used more help. And tomorrow is a demolition, demolition work bee so we are really going to need all hands on deck. We're pulling carpet and we're demoing um, cabinetry. So for those of you who have a little bit of pent up, maybe anger or angst, you can just come ready with your materials, your sledgehammers, and just have a go at it. We really would love to have your help. Um, also, as a, a few of you pointed out this morning, our children all month, for the rest of the month, are going to be having vacation Bible school. 
there in the rotunda and a few of the classrooms. Today, because of the Women's Ministries program, pickup is going to be a little bit different. Normally, we would pick up in the rotunda, but today, because there is a luncheon, as soon as we finish the closing, we will usher the children to the education wing. So you would pick them up in either room one, 2A, or 2B. And those rooms are just right up the stairs. It's the, they're the first three rooms to the education wing. Our call to worship verse this morning, verses... Um, found in Psalm 30, 4 through 5, and it reads, Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, hallelujah, comes in the morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here to worship you and to learn more of your love. I ask, Lord, that you help us to recognize your voice and your presence here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's a beautiful day today. We're here to praise God. Praise Him, praise Him, number 249. If we can stand as we sing this hymn, please. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing over His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor, give to His holy. This morning, we have a special segment um, right in uh, the middle of our women's ministry celebration. We have a young lady who's going to be dedicated this morning, a young lady in the making. Shira, would you please bring your parents, Shergai and Diane up?
Good morning. Good morning, Shira. So good to see you this morning. We are so um, privileged to be able to dedicate Shira today. Um, and parents, this dedication is for her, but also for you as well to um, just to dedicate your commitment to raising Shira in the ways of the Lord. And we know that you cannot do this alone. We know that you need a village because it takes a village. And I know that you have some friends here, if, uh, friends and family, if you are here to support this dedication, would you please stand? Friends and family, amen. So you have your, your close inner circle here. And thank you, you may be seated. Thank you for being here. And you also have your church family here that is um, going to be walking alongside you. Luke um, chapter 18 talks about how parents brought their infants to Jesus. And I am so grateful that today you are willing to do the same. Um, I want to ask your friends and your church family first, um, I want to ask if you as friends and family agree to assist in working toward the day when this act of dedication will be followed by baptism and a full entering of Shira into membership in the church family. Amen. Now, parents, this next question is for you. Do you covenant with God to promise to do all in your power to bring up Shira in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Do you so covenant with God? Very good. I was speaking with um, Sher Guy and Diane this week, and um, they were telling me of the miracles that were surrounded by um, Shira's birth and before. Diane was very specific to God during her pregnancy. Um, in her family, uh, there's a history of bed rest in pregnancy and so she prayed specifically to God God please let me work until the very end of my pregnancy and she reached the 40 weeks and worked all the way up until the day I believe before she gave birth so there was a very specific prayer answered amen and also she prayed, and I wish I had thought of this, Diane, but she prayed for a quiet baby. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think of this. But, you know, God invites us to carry our petitions to him and be specific. And they were sharing with me this week that sometimes they don't even realize they have a baby in the house because she's so quiet. And so what a blessing that is. But as baby Shira grows, there are some more specific things that you guys are desiring for her. We were talking with Shira Guy this week, and he said, you know, I desire for her to be loving, to be loving to others and to love God. And he says, and I really want her to love being engaged in church and I know that that is going to happen because sure guy you are very engaged in church sure guy is our pathfinder director and so he just cannot wait for her to go through adventurers and then pathfinders so sure is going to have a very active life ahead of her and so um, we're going to pray that specific prayer on Shira's life this morning. And um, is it okay if I hold her? All right. 
Is it okay to switch mics? Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a privilege, what an honor to be able to bring baby Shira before you this morning. I thank you, Lord, because you knew her before she was knit in her mother's womb. I thank you because I claim um, your word in the Bible where it says that you know the plans that you have for her. There are plans to give her a hope and a future. And so I thank you for those words over her life this morning. Lord, this morning, Sure Guy and Diane are bringing their precious treasure before you. They're also committing their lives as parents to do the best that they can to raise her in your ways and in the path that you have cut out for her. I ask, Lord, that you would help us as a church family to do all that we can, Lord, to walk alongside them and to encourage baby Shira in your ways. And I pray, Lord, that the special path that you have laid before her may come to fruition. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We have a met someone and immediately you feel an unexplained warmth? Good, because I have. God created an opportunity giving me the privilege of meeting this special lady. She does not know this, but immediately it was love at first hug. This lady has shattered many glass ceilings, and her biography is so extensive that if I should read it to you, it would take up most of the service this morning. So let me share a few highlights. Anne Myers Drysdale is a vice president and broadcaster of the Phoenix Suns and Phoenix Mercury. She participated in seven different sports in high school. And she was the first woman to receive a full athletic scholarship to UCLA in basketball. And there, she played in three different sports, volleyball, basketball, and, tr and track, winning championships. Now, in 1976, in the Olympics, she was the very first women's basketball team leader, winning the silver medal for the USA. And she has been on several USA teams, winning gold. Anne was a flag bearer in the opening ceremonies for the 1979 Pan Am Games. As captain of the 1979 World Championship team, they also won gold. She was the number one draft pick of the first women's professional basketball league and was the league's MVP. You see, she's not playing. Anne was the first and only woman to have tried out for the NBA with the Indiana Pacers. All guys, right? One woman. 
She has been inducted into almost 20 Hall of Fame. First woman inducted into the UCLA Hall of Fame, the Female International Basketball Federation, the Women's Sports Foundation. She completed, listen to this, she competed in the Women's Superstars competition and won three times. That was not enough, she was not afraid. She went and she competed in the men's superstar competition. <laughs> and she broadcasted six Olympic games and broadcasted men and women's championships, NCAA tournaments, volleyball, softball, you name it. And she worked for NBC, ABC, CBS, ESPN, and other media outlets. Now, she was part of the Phoenix Mercury, winning the three NBA titles, 2007, 2009. She was a general manager at the time, and in 2014 as a vice president. I'm almost done, guys. I, I, I condensed it as much as I could. Anne was married to the late Hall of Famer Dodge pitcher Don Drysdale and have three children, sons Don Jr. and Darren, and daughter Drew. Note that she does not believe in being second in anything, even against the men. <laughs> I chuckle at the title of her book, You Let Some Girl Beat You. And this is what I tell the women's ministries against the men's ministries. You make some girl beat you. Anyway, um, Anne reflects humbleness, and her heart is in the right place. She embodies playing smart, play hard, and winning will come. Her busy schedule with leading the NBA teams, she just had a smidgen of an opening today, and she came here to Camelback. She's here to share a few words with you, and I would like you to give her a warm welcome, but not yet. I just want to tell you one more thing. She's not here to recruit our pastor. Thank you so much. I was uh, able to, and it's a privilege and an honor to be here today, absolutely. I uh, met Paula and Merv through a mutual friend, and, and we became fast friends, and uh, the Lord blessed us in that way. But I wanted to read this little thing to you, and I thought you might enjoy it. So the Sunday school teacher decided to have her second grade class memorize Psalms 23, one of the most quoted passages in the Bible. She gave the children a month to learn the chapter. And one little boy was so excited about the task, but he just couldn't memorize the psalm. Although he practiced and practiced, he could hardly get past the first line. The day came for the children to recite Psalms 23 before the congregation. And when it was his turn, he stepped up to the microphone and proudly said, the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I need to know. <laughs> right? God is good. And being here, you know, this is the 50th, year of Title IX. I love stained glass up there. It says number nine up there, but I know it's for something else. But, you know, it's, you know, being a part of a team and uh, has been so important to me. My whole life, I've been a part of a team. Paula said that I don't like coming in second. I came in second a lot in my family. I have five brothers and five sisters. And so my mom and dad really taught us work ethic and teamwork and how to sacrifice for each other, and how to be there for each other. And being in women's sports, and seeing where it is today, and the opportunities that so many young girls and young women have today, is such a blessing to see the positiveness and how people support each other. And whether you're in church, or on a sports team, or anywhere else, we know that teamwork is important, and that you have to support each other. And I did a clinic last night at, at the um, Footprint Center, with a bunch of young girls and, and talked about Title IX, but also talked about girls supporting girls and women supporting women. And it's so important to be on their side, and you have to, as I said, sacrifice for each other. 
But I've been so blessed in so many different ways, the way I grew up with my family, and we all supported each other. We fought a lot, and uh, we made up a lot. But I'm so lucky in the sense of being where I am today. And um, I lost my husband. Uh, golly, it's um, just passed 29 years ago because our daughter had just been born. But we all know that we all have adversity in our life. And the good Lord makes you step one step at a time to get through things. And it's not always easy, but again, that support system is so important. And uh, I've met so many wonderful people here in the valley and have been so supportive with me. And, and to see where the Phoenix Mercury have gone, not only winning three WNBA titles, but to meet so many dynamic women in the WNBA. And we have a, a young woman on our team that is over in Russia trapped, Brittany Griner. And so not only are prayers so important for her, but the support for who she is as an American, as a woman in this country, and representing this town and this, this team. And so to be around these women and to see where the, the league has grown since 1997 and now today in its 26th year, and these are powerful voices that these women have. Two years ago when COVID hit, it affected so many of us. And these women that played in the bubble, as the NBA did, they changed lives. They changed the vote in Georgia. They made Black Lives Matter every game they were wearing shirts to know that that was out there. They have a voice, and women have a voice. And sometimes, you know, Paula said the glass ceiling, and, and I'm not a big proponent of the glass ceiling phrase, because when I grew up, we were told, sky is the limit. The sky is the limit. And yes, there are obstacles and barriers that come along, but for me, there was never a ceiling, and there still isn't today. And I just want to end this that says, be anxious for nothing and grateful for all things. Philippians 4, 6, 7. Thank you so much. Christians join to sing. Let's sing together. Come, Christians, join to sing. Alleluia, amen. Loud praise to Christ our King. Alleluia, amen. Let all with heart and voice. Praising our Lord, my maker and my king. If you read music and you want to sing parts, you may find that hymn is hymn number 15 and it's on the back of the pews.
prepare our hearts for prayer. Um, lead me, Lord, lead me to your righteousness. Let's bring all of our sorrows and pain to him and only him today. or kneel wherever you, whatever you can do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. We praise your holy name. We thank you for Jesus and the gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you're working in our lives day by day and moment by moment, drawing us closer to your side as we travel this road of sin and sickness. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Help us to share those blessings with others. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and transform our sin-sick souls that we may be lights shining in the darkness of this world. Father, we bring before you the children that are across the way in the rotunda. Bless those little ones, Lord. May their holy angels and the Holy Spirit be round about them as they learn about Jesus and the gift that you have for them. I pray for all the parents and those that are participating as well, Lord, that you will give them the words to speak and the way in which to speak them to teach these little ones about you. We pray for each one of us here, Lord. Each one of us may have come with burdens on our hearts, sickness, depression, financial problems. Lord, you know intimately what each one of us is facing today and the challenges we bring them all before you, Lord. We lay them at the feet of the cross and we say, Lord, please take these from us and fill us with the peace that surpasses all understanding. For we are asking you to guard our hearts and minds with your Holy Spirit. And Father, I want to bring a couple of prayer requests before you. There's those that are suffering with sickness. There's Claire Diaz and Log Patterson that are both having health issues, Lord, that are affecting their sight. Would you please put your healing hand upon them, along with everyone else standing here or sitting or kneeling before you, Lord. We pray that you would bring your healing touch upon us, whether it be physical, emotional, or spiritual. I also want to lift before you um, Brittany Griner. Lord, this is a very serious situation that she has found herself in. 
And I pray, Father, that it has led her to the foot of the cross to seek you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I pray, Father, that you will protect her and that she will be able to soon come home back to the United States and to her family. And I pray, Lord, a special blessing upon her that this event will lead her closer to you as it leads each one of us, Lord, when we are faced with the trials and tribulations of this life. May you be glorified through them as you lead and guide us. I pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us now in this worship service, that you will be glorified and not us, that Jesus will be lifted up, and that each one of us here, Lord, will go home refreshed because we've been in the presence of Jesus. And I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Today's offering will be for uh, Camelback Ministries. There are many ways that you can give your tithes and offering. At the end of the service today, there will be deacons out on the foyer waiting with, to take your tithes and offering. You also can mail it in to the church. You can stop by and see Sherry. Just make sure that you call ahead of time. You can also give online at camelbackchurch.org. Please bow your head, your head for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us all to your house safely today. We are so blessed by your presence here. Thank you for your love and your mercy on us. Thank you that you have plans for each one of us that are for our good and your glory. You said, give and it will be given to you in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give to you today as a response to your goodness to us. We ask that you receive our tithes and offering and continue to supply all of our needs. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace be in our words, and your love be in our hands, and your joy in our souls. In your precious name I pray, amen. Good morning, church family. I'm reading from the Remnant Study Bible of the New King James Version. The book is Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Before I introduce our speaker, I just want to remind you that after the church service, we do have lunch prepared for you. It's Italian lunch today, so we ask that you come over and fellowship in the rotunda after church. Our speaker today is one of our very own. Lilia Uriarty moved from Arizona from California in 2017, and she came to Camelback and we've been blessed to have her since then. She was raised from the age of nine onward in, in the San Francisco Bay Area where she had her first encounter with the Lord and was baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist faith at the age of 11. She's originally from Nicaragua, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but I'm trying, uh, Central America. Liliette's love for the Lord has found her passion in music, teaching, and sharing with others what God has done in her life. In 2017, Lilliet and her twin brother, Harold, launched a musical ministry called Chosen to Praise, which involves bringing a message of hope and love through music and testimony to our churches in the valley and wherever God calls them to go. Lilliet's greatest desire is to share Jesus and his transformational power with those souls thirsty for the Lord, his grace, 
his pardon and salvation. She's a tremendous blessing to her church family. What I know is that she loves the Lord, and this love is manifested through her singing, her facilitation of Sabbath school discussions, her personal testimonies, giving Bible studies and mentorship, and last but not least, her support of the women's ministries. Today, she will be the heavenly conduit for a message from our Father. Now, after we have been blessed by special music from Jackie Battlestone, Jackie is the right hand and left hand of our president of the Arizona Conference, uh, Ed Keyes. Now, after Jackie blesses us with her song, you will hear from Liliet, and she will inspire us through God's words. Good morning, everyone. What a blessing to be here at Camelback Church. And thank you so much, Paula, for inviting me. Thank you, Rochelle, for playing. And thank you all um, for listening to this praise to the Lord. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in Him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how He changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do Nadie pudo 
Good morning, everyone, and a happy Sabbath. What a beautiful song. If I'm not mistaken, Mom, that's one of your favorite ones. Thank you, Jackie, for that beautiful song. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be before you this morning. I want to thank Paula Williams for the invitation. Merv, thank you so much for having such a wonderful wife. I want to thank, I want to thank Pastor Stanton for sharing, for allowing me to share the pulpit or the stage this morning. And I want to thank God for a sacred, a sacred task for allowing me to do his work right here before you. If you wouldn't mind, put this down here. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we want to thank you so very much for the wonderful, wonderful father that you are, for being our redeemer, for being our savior, for loving us so much. We ask, oh, Father, that this morning you bestow us with that precious gift, the Holy Spirit. Get me out of the way of you, oh, Father, and allow us to see Jesus through this message. Use me in a powerful way. Prepare the hearts and the minds. And, Father, may your name be exalted, be glorified, Father, and may we remember that you are the Lord of the Sabbath, King of Kings, Father, and our Savior, Lord and King of this universe. We exalt you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Closest to the finish line, a defining moment. I grew up as the only child, or the only, I should say, female. I'm not the only child. The only female, the only girl in my family. I had two brothers. We were very close in age. One of them was three years younger than I and my brother. Unfortunately, he passed on. Motorcycle accident. But the one that remains is sitting here in the congregation, Harold. And Harold and I entered this world on the same day and at the, almost at the same time. So Harold and I are twins. We're not only siblings, but we're twins. I loved being with my brothers wherever they went. We were all about sports. And by the way, this, is, well, this was not planned. It was all about the sports. It was all about the playing outside with the neighborhood kids. It was all about doing the things that had to do with physical activity. My brother and my younger brother did mind that as the girl, the only female, I wish I had had sisters and more brothers, like Marianne uh, or Ann Myers. But I was blessed and privileged to have my brothers. And we would go around the neighborhood. Uh, we had one bicycle. This was in Central America, Nicaragua. And we would take turns to go around the neighborhood. Around the neighborhood. We would play with the neighborhood kids. We would climb trees. We would pluck the mangoes, throw them down. We would eat marañón. Do you know what marañón is? Who knows here who, what a marañón is? You know what a marañón is. A marañón is a fruit that on top has a seed where the cashew pro uh, uh, proceeds from. That cashew, that you, uh, the seed that you eat, it is on top of that fruit, marañón. So we would love to go out there and everything. Now we come to America, and we follow the same traditions. We go outside into the neighborhoods and we play. We had a park about a half a block away from our home. We lived in an apartment, South San Francisco, Randolph Avenue, I'll never forget. And we used to go and play basketball. We used to ride bikes. Harold used to love to go on ramps and just jump off the ramps with his bicycle. And we would get the neighborhood kids and we would form teams. Remember, Harold? We would form teams to play football, of course. I was in the team. I think I was the only girl in the team. But it was tag football, in all fairness. We played, we loved it, we loved it, we loved it. Now, fast forward to my high school year, senior year in high school. 
I ended up finishing my senior year at a school that some of you may recognize. That school was Monterey Bay Academy, a Seventh-day Adventist boarding school. I had never left home. We were very sheltered, I especially as the girl. I was very girly, girly, but I loved sports. I loved getting out there and playing. I loved being with the boys. But when I got to school, this was a very new experience for me. Because my mom was very sheltered. She protected her little girl, and I was not even allowed to do sleepovers. Many times I would ask to go sleep over my friend's house, and my mother would say, no. Absolutely, don't even ask, don't even think about it, okay. However, I was up for the challenge to be in this school where everything was new to me. The whole experience was new to me. I made friends. I actually arrived in the summer. And the reason why I arrived in the summer is because I needed to help my parents with tuition. So I was working there during the summer. School began, classes began, I made friends, I joined the choir, and then I joined some sports. The two passions of mine were music and sports. And about midway through the year, the school announced that they were going to have a sports event. They were going to have a triathlon. This sport included, included Running, biking, and swimming. There was only one problem. I was about 30 pounds overweight. You see, I had a lot of friends in school that loved to eat. We used to get together, and we used to love to eat. In fact, we knew what room was selling M&Ms, what room was selling Butterfingers, and we just told each other, hey, who's got the Butterfingers room 32? We knew exactly where to go. We got tired of the vegetarian diet, so we would order out and we'd have beef sandwiches brought to campus. It was impossible not to gain weight. So my friends and I decided, we're going to do something here. We got we to gotta get in shape. We're going to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and we're going to run a few laps before we hit the cafeteria, before school. So we set ourselves out to run, I don't know, maybe three to five laps. We would start and we would finish the very first lap right in front of the cafeteria. And we'd go right into the cafeteria. Forget the other laps, we were hungry. We had to eat. Of course, you had the egg beaters, you had the tater tots, which were my favorite, you had the waffles, you had the pancakes, and then at night you had the sloppy joes, you had the pizza, you had the veggie burgers, carbs, carbs, and more carbs. You may remember, Rochelle, because I know you went there. Okay. I had gained 30 pounds when I left that school. This little frame had 30 pounds extra. So when they announced that they were going to have a triathlon, immediately, instinctively, I said, I'm going to join. I'm going to join, and I'm going to do this sport event. However, I didn't feel competent. I did not feel in shape to be able to withstand. But I said, you know what? I'm going to try it anyway, even if I'm slowpoke, even if I make it last. I'm going to do it. So we show up, we sign up, everybody there was boys. I wish I would have met Ann Myers at that time. I was a little intimidated, but there was one girl. I can't remember her name at this moment. It was her and I. And I thought, forget the boys. I'm not going to compete with the boys. I'm going to compete with this girl. Okay, she's going to be my competition. Okay, so we went, signed up, and we started the race. We had done the running, and now it was time to do the biking. Last, lastly, it was to do the swimming. 
So we had started the biking. The boys cleared out immediately. Whoosh, they disappeared. We couldn't even see them. It was she and I, and that was it. And it looked something like this. She was in front of me. I was behind her about 15 feet or 20 feet. She was huffing and puffing. She was also overweight. I was huffing and puffing. She was off her saddle. I was off my saddle. My strategy was, I'm getting real tired, but you know what? I'm going to let her break my wind. I'm going to be right behind her, and I'm not going to pass her up because what's the point? She's going to then pass me up, and we're going to be doing this, and I'm going to spend all my energy. I'm going to save my energy. I'm going to stay behind her, and when I'm getting really close to the finish line, boom, I'm going to pass her up. But I started noticing that as I was riding, I kept my cadence, same cadence. She was getting nearer and nearer. I was closing in on her. So I realized at that moment that she was slowing down. She came to a full stop and toppled over. At that moment, I went to get off my bike and I said, oh my word. This girl passed out, heart attack. I didn't know what had happened. When I go to remove myself from my bike, I noticed that there was a guy, there were a couple of guys and some on the bed of the truck, a couple of guys on the bed of the truck. They all got out and they said, don't worry, we've got this. We will take her back to school. You keep going in your race. They were from the school. They were staff and they were there to protect us. Because you imagine, this, this was not on campus, by the way. This was out on the streets of La Selva Beach, Watsonville. And it was very, very, you know, uh, there was a lot of nature and, you know, woody areas, wooded areas. And so we were there. We were just, you know, enjoying nature. So they place the girl in the truck. They take off. And all of a sudden, I find myself by myself. There was no one around. Everybody had left. No truck behind me, but thank God I was not too far away from the school. So I get to the school, and by the way, I've always thought, I think she did that on purpose. Because she knew I was closing in on her. And she thought, I ain't going to be a loser here. I'd rather just chalk it off to I passed out. I have always thought that, but I can never confirm it. So I get to campus, and now I get to the place where the pool is. Do you remember where the pool is, Rochelle? Okay, so I'm there at the pool. All the cheering was gone. The bleachers were empty. All the hoopla was no more. And the race as I knew it was over. And I looked at the PE teacher and I said, do I really need to do the three laps or whatever laps, however many laps we needed to do? He motioned me and he goes, finish it off. So there I go. That's not me, by the way. I wish it were me. So there we go, I jump in the water, and I finish off my laps. Something in me says, this feels really dumb, but I'm going to do it anyway. I did some laps, I got out of the pool, and then I went back to my room. I changed, and it was time to get the prize. It was time to get the awards. So the million dollar question for me was, who won this race? Did I win the race because I actually made it to the finish line and finished off the race? We were now in separate categories, of course. The men, you know, they had their category. The women, just the two of us. By the way, there were about 500 kids at that time at Monterey Bay Academy. 
And only two girls signed up, a bunch of chickens. Only two girls. So I was thinking to myself, did I win this race? I think I did because I finished it off. But could she have won this race? Because she was ahead, but she toppled over. So my question was, who won this race? Who do you think won the race? Me? Okay, a lot of you are saying me. Me. The awards or the medals came out. The gold medal goes to her. I forget her name. <laughs> I wish I remember. I wish I would remember her name. I would look her up. <laughs> she got the gold medal. The silver medal, though in some instances, silver medal, not bad at all. In this case, I was last. I got the silver medal. I've always contemplated writing a letter to the principal of the school about this. <laughs> it has never left my mind, so much so that I'm making a sermon out of it. <laughs> so, though in my view, I had won this race, I realized that moment that I did not win the race. Because I needed to have a, comp a competitor. I needed to have competition. I needed someone beside me to go against so that I could say I won the race. And she did not win this race because though she was ahead of me, she never made it to the finish line. So closest to the finish line, but neither of us won that race. However, she, she took the gold medal. How do you think I felt? I felt so disillusioned. I felt so disappointed. There was a very strong feeling of sadness in my heart. So much so that I wanted to cry, but I didn't want anybody to see me cry. I got up, I went to my room, and I wallowed in my sorrow. I don't think I ever even called my mother to let her know because I know that my mother would have been really sad to hear my voice. But that was a defining moment for me. A defining moment for me. And I'll share with you a little later on in this sermon why that was. My disappointment was so severe, was so great, that I just didn't want to come out of the room. I felt into a very, very short but very, very brief depression. I thought, how unfair. But nothing compares to the disappointment, to the sadness that overcame a man in the Word of God that wanted to bring a people across the finish line, that wanted to bring a people to the goal line. That moment was a moment of sadness for Moses. Moses had stuck with God through and through, followed every single command. He was given the Ten Commandments. He was given the civic laws. He was given the ceremonial laws for him to write. He spent 40 days with God face to face. He was a very special man. He loved the Lord and he loved his people. But because of one little mishap, he was not allowed to cross that finish line. They got to the Jordan River. That was the finish line. And he was prevented from going in. He was told, or actually he prayed, I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains of Lebanon. He prays to the Lord, 
But the Lord replies. And here is Moses, Moses talking to the children of Israel. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, and the east. Beholding it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. How unfair. When I read this passage, I thought to myself, how Moses must have felt. What an unfair God is what I thought. How could God do this? But my experience that I have lived hand in hand with God has taught me that the love that God has for us is unchanging. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. He's the same today, and he is the same forever. That same loving father that was with Adam and Eve and Abraham and Joseph and all of the patriarchs and Moses is the same God that loves us Today, he says in Jeremiah 31, 3, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. You could see the love of God displayed because he brought them out of Egypt. He did everything possible. He trained an individual called Moses. He took him through the wilderness for 40 years, polished him up, though he didn't know it, and then he brought him into Egypt. He stuttered. He couldn't speak well. He was afraid. He had stage fright. He wasn't ready for this. Yet God used him, shaped him, empowered him. And here is Moses now bringing the people out of Egypt. They find themselves now at the Jordan River, and now he's not able to cross himself. So I ask myself, why such harsh penalty? You see, I understand that everything God does has a reason. And everything he doesn't do or allows has a reason. That has been my experience. I don't know if that's been your experience. So he rounds up the two leaders. And in this case, we see Moses and Aaron. And he says, then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. They disobeyed God's command. But you want to ask me, okay, Lilia, what did they do that was so bad? It had to do with a rock. If you recall, they were thirsty. They complained to Moses, and they said, we need water. So Moses goes to God. God gives him instructions so that he is able to get water out of this rock. And he says, behold, I will stand before you, Moses, there on the rock in Horeb. And you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. Moses followed this instruction to a T. That was in Exodus. Now, fast forward in their journey to the book of Numbers, and you find a very similar situation. Another rock. Another need for water. So, of course, Moses goes back to God, and here is God giving him the instructions. Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, and speak. What was it before? Strike. So he was supposed to strike. This was back in, in Exodus. And now we're in Numbers, the book of Numbers. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their 
animals. So God switches it up a little bit for Moses. So what does Moses do? All right. He gathers the congregation and he says, hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? First and foremost, that must we. That sounds like a lot of people. That was God bringing out the water, right? It wasn't Moses or Aaron or anybody there that was, had leadership roles. Then Moses lifted his hand and what? Struck the rock how many times? Twice with his rod and water came out of it abundantly and the congregation and their animals drank. The Lord had told Moses, you are to speak. Not only did he disobey God, he struck the rock, but he struck it how many times? Twice. Why was striking the rock allowed by God in the first instance and not the second instance? Forgive the typo there. Why is, was it okay to strike the rock at the beginning? It's a question I ask myself. Well, what was, the, what was the big deal? If he struck the rock at the beginning, why couldn't he? And by the way, did water come out of it the second time around? Yes, it did. Were the people able to satisfy their thirst? Yes, they were. But something had happened. Something of magnitude, proportions, had occurred. And it had to do with that rock. You see, the rock represented whom? It represented Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4, it says, Paul speaking, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For the drink, for the drink of the spiritual rock, Okay, for they, you know, there's a little something there. Okay, it's amazing, right. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. You see, there was some symbolism there. That rock represented Jesus Christ once to be struck for our sins, once to, once to be killed for our sins. God intended to establish a picture of Christ as our Redeemer. Christ died once for all, and no further sacrifice for sins is required. Because if you remember, people would slain the lambs to, you know, to, to get the forgiveness of sins because the lamb represented whom? Christ. And when Christ came to this earth and he died on the cross, no longer do we need to do sacrifices anymore. Because the true Lamb of God already had died. And so that symbolism was obliterated by Moses doing what he did. You find this also in Hebrews 7, 26 and 27 that says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, meaning Jesus, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, as a regular high priest, where they would daily sacrifice a lamb, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, meaning the high priest's, the human beings, and then for the peoples, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. You see, there's a verse in the Bible that has always impacted me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. Am I smarter than you, Lord, that I want to do it my way, or will I trust your ways? He says, verse 9, as the heavens, Liliet, are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, Moses was put to rest. Moses was taken by God to a hill, and he there saw all of Canaan. 
all that was going to belong to the children of Israel. But he could not cross over and obtain that land himself. Deuteronomy 34, 5 says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. According to the word of the Lord, and he buried him. Who buried him? God, capital H. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. By the way, Moses didn't cross the finish line. Aaron didn't cross the finish line. Bless you. And guess who else didn't cross the finish line? The people that had been counted in the first census, those who were 20 and above, those who engaged in the licentious activities and idol worshiping with the heathens in Moab, the Midianites, those who engaged in those activities were condemned to death. They were going to die off in the next 40 years. And that is exactly what happened. That's why they spent 40 years in the desert. They had to die off. They had to die. When the last one had died off, that was the time to cross over. So Moses, Aaron, and all that generation did not cross the finish line. Wow. God is such a loving God, but he has very high standards for us. Very high standards because he wants to give us the best. He wants to give us the best. However, this is not a story of defeat. Please lo- let me not finish here. This is a story of victory. Because though Moses did pass away, Moses was resurrected by Jesus. And we know this because we find a passage in Jude 9. And it says, yet Michael, Jesus, another name for Jesus, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation. He wasn't going to get tit for tat with the devil. You know what? May the Lord rebuke you. I'm taking Moses. And he took Moses. And we know that he took Moses because we see Moses in the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew 17, 1 through 3, it says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, meaning Jesus, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. There is Moses And there is Elijah. Now, what does Moses represent? Moses represents those of us who may end up passing on in this life. And Jesus still is not here. But yet we died in Christ. Elijah represents those who, when Jesus returns to take us home, we will still remain alive. There are the two representations there. Beautiful story of Moses. A beautiful representation of the love that he had for God. You know what? I have found that when you love God with all your heart, you're going to love people. You're going to love people. You're going to be patient with people. You're going to try to help and give a lending hand. When you have the love of God, you want to bring them to Christ. When you have the love of God, you want to take them across the finish line. When you have the love of God, you just want to have everybody join you when it's time to go to heaven. That's having the love of God. You know, another thing I've learned, a little separate, a little side note, those people that have the love of God also love their pets and also love pets in general. I have known people that have been very nice to me, but have not been very nice to my pets. And I've resented that. I've resented that, you know. But the love of God is all-encompassing. If you love God, you're going to love people, and you're going to love his creation. 
a defining moment. That day at Monterey Bay Academy, I was changed forever. I learned that life will throw curveballs your way, and you better be prepared. I learned that life will at times bring with it a, deg dis a degree of disappointment, unfairness, sadness. I learned that I am running the race of my life, and it has nothing to do with sports. I learned that though people may want to put you down or put me down and step on you, you are a child of the king. And you are to rise above because you are a created, precious created being. And he wants to bring you home. I learned that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against those rulers of darkness of this age. I learned that God will place me in situations where I will be tested. I learned that I better be spiritually fit if I want to cross the finish line. I learned that God wants to use me and you to help bring those other people across the finish line. I learned that I'm not to let anything or anyone prevent me for cro from crossing that finish line. And lastly, I learned that God wants to give me a crown and that no one is going to take my crown. Through Jesus Christ, I can conquer. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The Lord is calling upon you today. He wants to bring you across the finish line. He wants to give you and show you mighty things. Will you let yourself be used? Jeremiah 33, 3. Very easy verse for you to remember. Three threes. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call to me. You want to repeat it with me? Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. The best is yet to come. May God bless you this morning. Let's stand up as we sing our closing song, If We Never Pass This Way Again.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, what a wonderful and loving Father you are. Your ways are unsearchable. Sometimes we don't understand why things turn out the way they do. But help us to know that you have our best interest at heart. Help us to trust you blindly. Help us to surrender our lives completely to you. To not ever doubt your love, your grace, and your mercy. Bless us today, Father. Give us a, an unction of your Holy Spirit. May we remember, Father, that we're in the Sabbath hours. Father, may we bless others today with a helping hand, with a smile, a hug, or a shake. Thank you for being with us today, Father. Never depart from our side. It is in Jesus' precious, blessed, and sacred name that I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.